Awesome. Right. Welcome to the February 2021 Fellows Community Call. Um, it's wonderful to see you all again. Um, just some general guidance for our calls. Just remember to be kind, be understanding, and be flexible, both with yourselves and with others. Um, we do have a code of conduct, which is linked in the notes, um, so you can report any issues to myself or Schwabe, and that's all linked there in the notes document. Um, this call is being recorded and the videos will be made available on the SSI YouTube channel after the call. So um, if you are happy sharing your face, um, feel free to leave your video on, but otherwise you can turn it off. Um, and then just keep yourself muted when not speaking to minimize background noise. Um, the notes documents are for SSI fellows only. Sometimes we, you know, add kind of sensitive information in there, um, especially when we're talking about how we're feeling in the check-in. Um, so just don't share the link publicly with anybody, but do feel free to use it um, to take any notes, ask any questions, add friendly comments, plus one, et cetera. Um, leave links to videos of uh, rovers landing on Mars, et cetera. Um, yeah, so the goals of the community calls are to facilitate community building and encourage collaboration within the SSI fellows community. We wanna check in with the fellows um, and offer any care that we can. Um, what are you up to and how can we support you? Um, and we also wanna provide a welcoming and inclusive space for fellows to share and explore topics of interest and network with others. So today we have three fellows updates uh, from Emily, Anna and David. Um, and then um, if there's time, we have um, some breakout room discussions at the end. Um, we are hoping to get some help from you um, with regards to discussion topics for Collaborations Workshop 2021, which is just around the corner now. Um, so basically we have a list of suggested topics from registrants uh, for the event, and we would just really appreciate your insights and your help um, to kind of organize them into the various themes of CW. Um, but we also wanna hear what your suggestions are for discussion topics and make sure that we're capturing um, what the fellows think we should be discussing relating to fair research software, diversity and inclusion and software sustainability. And if none of that floats your boat today, then we have kind of a lucky dip breakout room if you wanna go in and chat about anything else. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll get started with our fellows updates. So the fellows updates are opportunities for fellows to share or show and tell um, during our community calls. Fellows will each have around five minutes plus time for Q&A to introduce themselves and share any updates to the network, such as their fellowship plans, any demos of projects, upcoming events, or other activities. Um, if you have any calls for collaboration or anything you're seeking support on, we'd love to hear about it, um, or life after the fellowship and how the fellowship has impacted your career um, or anything else that you want to showcase, um, we'd love to hear about it. So today we're going to hear from Emily, Anna, and uh, David. So I will go ahead and stop sharing and hand over to Emily. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to provide an outline of my fellowship plans for the rest of 2021, which are quite different from what I'd initially proposed due to the pandemic. Uh, things were on hold for much of 2020, but I feel like I'm now making good progress. So as a quick background, I'm a digital humanities researcher and I work as a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of English at the University of Leeds. I'm particularly interested in how we might encourage software reuse in humanities scholarship rather than constantly reinventing the wheel. And I want to explore this issue both more broadly across DH and within a specific subdomain, which is digital editing and transcribing of historical documents. Many projects feel the need to build tools from scratch when there are many different existing platforms. And this also creates issues with interoperability where it would be beneficial for projects to be able to speak to each other, but they just weren't designed that way. I've found that people in my field come at this issue more or less the same way in that they're primarily historians or literature scholars and need the quickest and simplest way to achieve a task. They don't have a clear sense of the software specific issues that they should consider until much later. And usually at that point it's too late and they've already committed money and time and they're reluctant to change. Uh, there are a couple of ways that I'm trying to help mitigate this. Firstly, I'm a faculty member for the Institute for the Editing of Historical Documents, which is currently designing an online fundamentals course for editors working with historical documents. So this training, which will be fully open access, will provide an introduction to different software for editing and displaying editions so that creators can make good choices at the beginning of the process. We're currently designing that course and it'll be launching next year. 
Secondly, I'm chairing a roundtable next week on the 4th of March on 19th century archives and handwriting in the digital age, and I'll put the link into the chat. Uh, this event will bring together representatives from five different digital projects addressing health, morbidity, mortality and occupational health in the Victorian and Edwardian post office, the Charles Dickens Letters Project, the George Eliot Archive, Herman Melville Electronic Library and One More Voice. In addition to discussing issues around working with archives, the discussion is going to include consideration of the different digital platforms the projects use. And I see this as a first step in creating a stronger community around digital editing software. The planned follow up to this is a series of events that me and Anna Maria Sishani, who is another 2020 SSI fellow, are planning for autumn on assessing the life cycle of digital editing projects. Uh, these are intended to be afternoon workshops with invited participants, which will attempt to address evaluations of tools and methodologies, infrastructure, documentation and sustainability. Anna Maria has already done some great work in this area and she's published a special issue on editing tools and environments. And again, I'll, I'll put a bunch of links into the chat when I'm finished. Um, my work with the Institute for the Editing of Historical Documents has also given me quite a few contacts in this area that I'd like to bring together to discuss these issues. Another strand that me and Anna Maria are pursuing is a broader initiative to foster reuse of software in digital humanities research. So we're holding a short roundtable as part of the collaborations workshop, which is do not make it new, which is a modernism pun, on reusing research software and tools in digital humanities scholarship. So we're inviting three speakers who either create humanities research software or are representatives from major funders of humanities research like the AHRC. And we hope that this initial 30 minute discussion with the participation of the attendees of the event um, will give us further ideas to pursue in a follow-up workshop later in the year. We're using our fellowship funds, we finally found a way to use some uh, to cover their registration, hoping to bring some new people to the SSI. Um, so finally, there's a couple of main areas which are on my mind and I'd be grateful for any input that people might have. Uh, firstly, how do you encourage the participation of people who don't see themselves primarily as creators or even users of research software? How do you show them that these discussions are important for them and also interesting um, for them? And secondly, how do you get participation from funders in these conversations? Um, so in inviting for this roundtable, we've been thinking about advisory boards, um, whether it's academics or representatives from the funders directly. Um, how do you include them without feeling like you're attacking them? And how do you start to foster change at that kind of level? Uh, humanities funders in the UK, it must be said, focus on novelty generally. So projects that aim to reuse existing software seem to be much less likely to get funded. Uh, thank you. And I'm gonna stick a bunch of links in the chat now. Awesome, thank you so much. Virtual round of applause. And does anybody have any questions or comments or suggestions for Emily? I'm gonna start copying the links over to the notes as well. Um, so, so, so it sounds like there's a lot of opportunities that you're creating to bring people together to, to foster these discussions and you hope to have a larger workshop in on it in the future. Um, I know that at CW21, which I've written as CW20 in the notes because that's where my brain is still, um, uh, it's only a 30 minute session, which is difficult to achieve a lot. So just a reminder that you can also use the hack day as an opportunity while you have people together to kind of hack on a, on a future workshop as well, if that's something that you wanted more time um, with participants who are there to do. Uh, Mario. So, so uh, just uh, my ignorance here. Um, so you're talking about the, the editing of historical documents. So presumably at some point, somebody has gone away, scanned in the, the original sources and done some uh, OCR on it and uh, produced some, some electronic text that then uh, you edit. Is, is, that, is that correct? Um, all parts of that process would come under the editing of historical documents, basically. So sometimes people just have offline documents and they're manually typing them up. Wow. Um, sometimes people are, are creating digitized, as you say, like page images. Um, and OCRing it, but I think a lot of people come at this with, we have some documents, we have very few technical skills, and we need someone to tell us how to do it. 
Um, and that's why I think that's why there's a problem. They don't think about they don't think of themselves as developing software or really using software. They come at it from the, the historical problem um, and then sort of fall into whichever platforms are recommended to them, usually by their institution. So so can I have just one quick follow-up question? So so if somebody has actually gone to the trouble of um photographing something, scanning it and done some OCR, produced some text. I've got two MSC students are looking at some some text like this, and um, generally the OCR software is not always great. Is it a process of feeding back corrections to the system? I mean, or or um, or do, do people make their own corrections and then don't feed back? That's been my experience: is that normally people take the OCR text and they they might use something like Zooniverse to get corrections. Um, or, or crowdsource corrections to the OCR text, and quite a few projects have done it that way. Um, but they don't tend to to go back to whoever's OCR'd it. Then that's just locked into their project and their platform. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think next is Neil. Oh. Here's just a quick comment. Um, on your question to us about how to engage funders and whether it was a problem and if they feel attacked. Um, I think I think in general, actually, funders don't mind that too much. I mean, they don't want to be attacked, but they certainly want to engage. And I, I feel you can reach out and and try and just invite them along to, to the sorts of events you're running. The The big challenge is always one of time. So it's it's not a case of them not wanting to engage. It's a case of whether they are actually able to make the time to engage, which is hard. But um, yeah, I, I see Yo has their hand up as well. I don't know if they're going to be answering that question, but um, when I was doing it on the other side as, as a sort of semi-funder, I certainly didn't mind it. It was more a case of whether or not I was able to. Thank you. Next in my order of hand raised is James. James, did you have something that you wanted to add? I um, didn't catch it. Uh, me, yes. Um, two things. Um, small one is, do you include in your advice to digitize a 600 DPI? Because we discovered that the hard way, that 300 DPI and handwriting really don't go that well together. I will um, make note of that. <laughs> Thank you. And the other one is that uh, one way to attract people is to have titles like how to run a failing project. Those sort of slightly humorous titles tend to attract people. So we, we, we do quite well teaching computer science. We have a paper we give out to our students called How to Write a Failing Project, How to Write a Failing Project, and so on. Thank you very much. I'm making a note of that. And then final question from Yo or comment. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Neil actually did manage to guess what I wanted to say. <laughs> Uh, which is just that I do actually work for a funder and I am very interested in discussions about maintenance and supporting maintenance also. Um, partly because I need to justify this to my peers and my higher ups as to why we should be, be supporting software maintenance. Um, so I work for the Wellcome Trust, which is mainly life science healthy areas. But we also have the Wellcome Collection, which is also very much museum-y. So there may be some alignment. Maybe we can catch up after. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. Amazing. Um, right. Uh, next up, we have Anna. Hello, everyone. I'm just gonna, I've actually got slides. So I'm gonna share. Uh, let's see, I think it's that one. Is that right? Can you see my slides? Excellent. So, um, <laughs> So in my brief, uh, I, the brief that I got was to discuss a little bit about how the pandemic has, a, has affected um, my project or our project. So that's sort of what I'm gonna focus on. Um, and to start off with, hello, uh, I'm Anna Cristalli. I'm a research software engineer at the University of Sheffield, although I've escaped to Greece uh, before the last lockdown and I'm still here. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub. And I'm also editor for R OpenSci and a co-organizer for the Sheffield R users group. 
And I'm just gonna jump in straight away with a little bit of background on the project. So I joined um, the SSI fellows in 2019. And my proposal was to run some repro hacks. Uh, that's the name of the project. Uh, with the first event being held as part of the Carpentry Connect Manchester in 2019. And what Reaper hacks are, they're basically one day reproducibility hackathons. So the mission for the day is to reproduce a paper um, in that day from associated published code and data. But the more broader goals of the project are to sort of try and figure out how reproducible are papers that um, published code and data actually are. Um, and then also to try and figure out whether we can provide sandbox environments for both authors and reviewers to try and start practicing reproducibility because both of these are still lacking. We talk a lot about reproducibility. But we still don't have uh, standardized ways of checking whether papers are reproducible and we still don't really practice it as part of our day-to-day our -day sort of research work. Um, so just quickly how um, initially we have a call for papers. So we invite authors to uh, propose their papers for reproduction. And hopefully if this stage goes well, you have a nice paper list uh, for people to uh, work on on the day. So on the day, uh, we, we start with a bit of an introduction and then participants are free to select a paper they wanna work on and form groups if they want to. And then they spend most of the rest of the day working with the materials, trying to reproduce them. Uh, we regroup a number of times to just sort of feed back to the group and discuss how we're getting on. Uh, but the most important part of the day is at the end, we ask participants to fill in a feedback form that then goes back to the author. So the authors get something out of this uh, as well. So since the fellowship, there's been a, a number of events run both myself and others uh, from the Reaper Hack community. So the first one was the Leiden Reaper Hack in the Netherlands. Um, and this was actually the biggest event to date then. Uh, it led to, it wasn't organized by me, but it did lead to the formation of a core team around the project. And I have to give them a shout out because they just won the Open Initiatives Trophy at the Dutch Open Science Fair this week. So good job, ladies. Um, so that was really cool. And then we also got some support from the NHCIR and they asked uh, me to run a series of, of five events uh, across five uh, Northern universities in the UK. This was about this time last year. So inevitably we got hit by COVID and uh, after four really fun events uh, and I'd, I'd actually, with support from the SSI, flown one of the core teams over from uh, Buenos Aires so she could get experience so she could do the Latin R one. She ended up being having to cancel one of the events uh, in Manchester. But what this led to was it sort of forced us to uh, go for something we've been we've been talking about right from the beginning, and this was to go remote. So this led to our first remote Rebro hack, which actually I'd say went really well. It was probably the best at the time, uh, and then this led nicely into the Latin R Rebro hack, and I could attend, and we didn't have to find sponsorship money, which was great. Um, and David helped with that as well which uh, then kind of led into the UCL week-long Reaper hack, which your, the update's coming soon by David, so I'm not gonna discuss that anymore. Uh, so just quickly, uh, I'm just gonna summarize some of the uh, benefits and some of the strategies we have. Um, so we found loads of benefits actually. Uh, more, we saw it more of an opportunity than a challenge. And the top one was, we just found it more physically accessible, uh, not, not accessible in the traditional way, but just more people could be there. Um, so most of the uh, core team could be there uh, and we're spread out across the UK, Netherlands and Argentina. Um, so we had representatives from all those countries. We 
uh, it meant it was more accessible for additional contributors. So we actually had lots of talks at our events this time. So uh, we had at ours a uh, talk on research compendia by Daniel List in Germany. We had Daniel PK come and talk to us about finding a missing data point in a very well cited paper. Uh, and he joined us from the US. And then we had a lovely fellow um, from the UK talking to us about uh, Binder Hub. Equally with the Latin RB, perhaps there were people from all over. Um, and then we also found it much more accessible for participants. So in the first remote one, we had people from Japan, Netherlands, Sweden, and the US. So that that was very cool. Uh, and, it, and it just meant that with, we could have a much larger session with very minimal sponsorship. So we normally at the events that are in person, because we offer lunch and coffee and things like that, we do have to limit how many people can attend and obviously okay they didn't get a free lunch but uh, more people could attend so that was great uh, the other thing we found is it was easier to experiment with a format but i think david is going to speak to that a little bit more and then just finally a few strategies for that we see the benefits of an in-person event so for online icebreakers are kind of even more important uh, so we did split participants up into breakout rooms initially so they can get to know each other. Um, but one thing we really liked about the platform we use, which is Blackboard Collaborate, was that we can you can rename the rooms themselves. So we also set the groups with a task to um, give their breakout room a name. So we ended up with uh, much more interesting spaces to, to work in, which you can see some of them there. And, uh, and one nice thing about the hacky vibe of Reaper Hacks is that we often get impromptu uh, peer skill sharing sessions. And so that's how we ended up having Docker School on the beach <laughs> at the moment Reaper Hack, which was uh, kind of funny. And then um, the key thing was for participants were able to move around. And in Blackboard Collaborate, this is what we could do. So the kind of setup we used was, we used the main room for talks and for uh, coming back and sharing out how it's going and also communal workspace. I think we had music going at Latin R provided by David in the uh, main room uh, at some point. Um, the icebreaker breakout rooms, people, uh, groups tended to go and work there um, if they're working on the same paper. And then we also had some other random spaces like a cafe and, and other private spaces that people could go chat informally or even just work on their own if they wanted. And then we just used the chat for sort of discussion and questions and lots of clapping at talks and things. And then finally, the other thing that we missed about um, in-person events was that uh, we can give stickers. So, wrote this R code that generated tweets for everyone that attended and sent them a virtual sticker on Twitter, which you can see here. And that was kind of fun too. Um, finally, in terms of the challenges, I just say the main challenges was the internet connection. But other than that, we things seemed to go just really well and everyone enjoyed it. It seemed to get as much out of it as in the in-person ones we'd uh, done. So, uh, that's pretty much it. If people are interested in repro hacking, oh, I did do 10 minutes in the end, didn't I? Um, they can find information. They can join our Slack. There's a GitHub repo. You can uh, talk to us if you want to host your event or submit your own papers. And, it, and then that's it. So thanks for watching. And I'm happy to take any questions, but maybe we should wait till David's been as well and we can answer questions. Thanks so much, Anna. Virtual round of applause for Anna. Um, Mario, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's not a difficult one, but uh, but the, the two other challenges you didn't deal with as much is that you've got a multinational. Um, audience who is also geographically distributed. So one of the issues is the time zone issues. 
So, so if you wanted to get people together, did you actually have a core set of hours? And the other one is that they're dealing with uh, multiple languages as well. Did you expect everybody to be speak English or did you have different communities with non-English speakers? So um, the original re remote repro hack was a one-to-one -one replacement for the Manchester one. So we did say, you know, it is a UK event. Opening up, anyone can join. And we just ended up getting people turning up from Japan. Like we weren't expecting it. And we weren't going for a global event. It just happened. So obviously, if it was a global event, we'd be thinking about time zones and either doing two events or, or, or moving the times. But uh, it, they just turned up. <laughs> um, it was a UK-based event. And then Latin R, on the other hand, was all in Spanish, which I understood some of it. <laughs> But uh, again, that was uh, meant to be a Latin American event. It was all in Spanish and the time zones uh, were expected to be more sort of Latin America time zones. So they did have a, a, a core lo location, even though we were remote or core time zone, if you like, and a core language. We didn't try and be global. It just sort of... Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Um, we'll go on to David. Okay. So um, my talk uh, is just for an idea. Um, so what I, as Anna said, what I bring in here today is a how what my experience of organizing one of those record hacks, which. I never did. I had participated before on as a participant on one of the SSI events, uh, and this time I wanted to to, as we say in Spanish, take the bull by the horns and and go and try to organize one. So yeah, uh, Anna is Anna, and I am a fellow from back 2016, I think, and and I have nothing to do before this time <laughs> to report hack. So I just wanted to take. To do one. So to take some experience, I I knew already um, Florencia, Andrea, who has uh, was organizing the Latin R in in uh, sorry the um, rapper hack in Latin R, and and I was there only kind of as a helper. I just I, and I just remind remind me that I was also the DJ there. I completely forgot about that, and that was a one day event and. It was nice because, as Anna said, they have like multiple speakers over the day, and then we have like kind of sessions to separate in the groups, to find the papers, and then have another speaker to learn something, and then go back into the groups. And it was quite dynamic, and it it didn't look uh, boring uh, when you know uh, the fear that you have that people get bored when you are in an event for so many hours. But that um, activities, that chain of a uh, um, Multiple of talks and, and groups, activities and icebreakers that make it quite lively and quite nice. So there I learned uh, how to organize it, what I needed. And then I went and said, okay, I'm gonna organize one in less than a month time in UCL. And we did it in UCL at a, the Open Access Week uh, last year in October with at least a small twist. So I knew that uh, it was gonna be really hard to get people to be in a whole day on, on this type of event. And mostly when I advertised like so uh, early, so soon to the event. So I decided to run it over a whole week where we will have people from our team, the RSC team in UCL, available to support them as, as they need it. So we had a two hours meeting in the first day and one um, meeting at the end of the week to kind of um, share the experience. On the first day, we have a speaker, which was a speaker I, um, I would say, I grabbed from the other event on the Latin R. Uh, she, and I'm going to mention, I'm going to talk about her a little bit now. Um, and that's where we did the teams. Then those teams were working over the week as they could, right? So the idea was that they, they decide how was going to how to manage their time over the week and try to do the the 
to test the reproducibility of the papers. Most of the participants were from UCL, and one of them at least was connecting from China, which is something that they have happened uh, at least in UCL, where many students are coming from China, and they were in China and connecting to our events. So yes, they have the time zone difference, and we have to to handle. But we didn't have any of the authors. I will have loved to get in more like a UCL papers there to get and UCL authors to work in there. But uh, we didn't get any paper from UCL in the small in the short time that we advertised the event. So we used the one the same list of papers that Latina had, which is uh, one that the Repro Hack has been collecting over over the time. For this, we got four groups, and we tried to reproduce four papers, for which only one of them was fully reproducible. And one of the things that the participants, even though mostly of the participants were part of our group, of the RSC group, the other people who were taking part of it, they didn't need much of our help anyway. So they managed to get their things going. Our speaker that we bring was Daniela Valari from Ecuador. She gave the talk in, in Latin R and it was amazing. And I asked her whether she would like to give a talk at the UCL. Uh, event and she was happy to translate her talk. There's slides there. I can share the link later. And I really loved how she made how she framed the responsibility as as selfish reasons on on doing it, like why you do it, but from the selfish point of view. And it was great. And on top of that, we also have a podcast recording to the event. So Peter Schmidt, which is a, one of our team members in UCL, he's been helping on the RSC Stories podcast. He's also created a new one, Code for Toad, and our, our event will be, uh, whatever he recorded in our event, it will be um, aired in his next episode. So in summary, uh, the format of the whole week worked very well. Uh, the people who were at the beginning were also on Friday at the end, at the end of, the, of the event, so that was, I wasn't scared about that, whether no one will appear, but they did. Uh, the speaker contextualized the importance of responsibility, and that was an important step to start that event, to have someone to explain it better rather than uh, what I would have done and saying, oh, yes, we want to reproduce because it's good, and here's the paper. So her introduction was great and was perfect for the event. Um, it will have been better if we would more um, people to uh, more participants. So we only got two researchers, the rest were RSCs. And it would have been better, um, as I say, the local authors or not local authors, if authors were there, which in the Aladdin R, there were a couple of them, and that was very helpful for testing their possibility and asking them questions. One of the comments from the participants that were there, it says that an engaging exercise learned a great deal about uh, improving. Uh, their science and their coding skills. So I think that, that was a great success. And that's all from me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Virtual round of applause. Any questions? Uh, I want to open up the floor to ask if anybody else wants to ask a question before I call on Mario. If not, we'll go with you, Mario. Oh, Shwebe. Well, let's start with Shwebe. Hi, hi, David. Uh, I've really enjoyed the uh, your presentation and uh, the other presentations. Um, so you mentioned team formation. So I just wanted to know if you did anything particular to help that happen, or what the mechanisms were that you used to help team formation. I now I don't remember. I used the same thing that we did at Latin R, which was about the cartoons and what was that thing. I have to check my notes. Anna, do you remember anything else? That was the icebreaker. So initially we put people randomly into groups just to introduce themselves. And one of the questions they need to answer is what their favorite cartoon is. But I think afterwards, when they start reviewing the papers, you start getting people saying, hey, I think I want to work on this. Does anyone else want to work on this? So it's, it's done more in the chat. Um, I think in a remote situation that could be done a little bit better, maybe in a little bit more organized fashion, um, like maybe using the hack pad a bit better, but 
we did have about 40 papers so it would have been weird to have a whole well maybe we could have had a, a whole list and people start marking for interest but yeah that was a bit ad hoc just in the chat no that's fine i was just interested oh, thank you yeah adding um, to that one of the comments we got sorry rachel <laughs> it was that the people wanted to uh, would have preferred to get like the like the list of papers before so they could come out with reading them like at least the list which it was available but they didn't see it right but uh, having them make more prominent say oh this is the papers we're going to review look at them try to choose them before going there but people choose randomly uh in, in our event but we were not many so that's good. um we'll go lucy then ben then mario Hello. Um, yeah, thanks for talking about the Wheat Pro hacks. You've, there's loads of good, I, you know, I'm writing down loads of ideas for future teaching, online teaching. Um, but I had a question about, because you said um, you would have liked to have attracted more um, people to forward their research as possible, you know, to try and reproduce more papers for reproduction. I thought, I mean, do you have an idea whether the problem is you're just not reaching the correct audience or is it that simply there really aren't that many papers that are in a state to reproduce so I'm, I'm partly you know asking this because I'm an SSI fellow and I'm thinking of my papers and thinking you know I would really struggle to share any of my papers just because I think you know there would just be so many problems with trying to reproduce it um, so do you have a feel for that? I mean, you know, is it that you're not reaching the right people or is it that the papers just don't exist <laughs> that are in a state for reproduction? I think a bit of both. I mean, we do try and uh, certainly when we're running local ones, really try and push the, uh, the getting in proposals as well as much as we can. But yeah, I, I do, even though we do tell them that this is in no way, uh, uh, we're not trying to discredit their work. We're not trying to nitpick their work. They're going to get a benefit from this because uh, they're going to get, you know, useful feedback uh, from others. I think still people are, are reluctant to, it, you got to be, put it out there, I think. And I think still not that many people do publish their code and data. Because we're asking for both code and data because it's got to be done in a day um so yeah i think a bit of both at some point we're because i think you can harvest uh, th th there's platforms like curate Sa science and i think now on zenodo people are tagging uh publications with research compendium so we could start harvesting like that but at the minute we want the authors involved. We don't want to see this as like an ad adversarial um, thing that we're doing to authors. To be fair though, our data is skewed because all the papers are self-selected already. So we can't really say anything about the state of the publication system, which at some point we'd like to, but for the time being, we do really want to engage and we do want um feedback to go back to them and we can only really get that if they accept the challenge ben? yeah i had um well, but related to the last two both the last questions so i mean i was wondering whether you have you thought about reaching out to to journals directly and saying like with you know when people submit papers to you for review like getting involved at some point already at that point and 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 whether I mean, that's an extra, that's potentially an extra burden on them at that point. So maybe you have to be careful, but like you could make connections with journals. That could be really exciting. Maybe there are journals out there that would be like really into this, like, like really pushing it. That's a really great suggestion. <laughs> uh, yeah, we should do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. Well, but, um, and then the other one was on the team creation point that I think Shrey was asking about because we so some of the hackathons we've been involved with like there was one we, we found that it, this is one of the hardest things as well and like um, like we tried to, one time we tried to sort of semi automate it looking at like what people had expressed before we, we kind of had to because this was like a huge like we had like almost a thousand participants so it was massive 
but then it just didn't work even like it, it, it we just had like total chaos because people got stuck in on the challenge and, and so I, I think the, yeah I guess if it's only ever a day then it's hard but like we needed at least the first day we had lots of people moving around and um, we needed like a just a slack channel just to have the discussions with people to change teams so uh, yeah I, I think it's an interesting sort of it could be an interesting collaborations workshop topic about like how do you do this I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Really cool. Are you? Yeah, so so I mean, you kind of already asked, well, partially answered my question. So I mean, I can see why you solicit the the involvement of authors. But if an, an author is not involved, um, do you still feedback to, to them? Do you, do you give them some critical stuff? I mean, so positive, no, not critical, positive stuff. And 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 it's, and especially if the paper is really bad and you can't even reproduce figure one on page one, um, what do you do? I mean, do, do you just not bother to get by to them or do you actually do send them something back and say, look, we're really trying very hard and it's just, we can't do anything. Yeah, they, the authors do get whatever feedback because they get scores as well for reproducibility, for transparency, for reusability. Um, and yeah, we've had, We've had papers, not one papers <laughs> with a score of one, but that, I mean, that's really useful feedback. And actually what it was, it, it's the, it was um, a paper that had actually a lot invested in making it really custom tool that hadn't been maintained. And then it was a Python 2 thing as well. And it just, there had been a lot of effort got into making this reproducible actually. But because the framework they tried to use needed maintenance itself, and that wasn't being maintained, it just all collapsed. So they needed to know that really, because I think they were banking on this being really solid. <laughs> and actually it just was impossible to, to work through. So they do get it, but so far we haven't had a paper that hasn't been in, proposed because still that's the only mechanism of getting paper into, um, the paper list is that it has to be submitted. Um, we should start exploring different avenues soon. <laughs> but um, yeah, for the time being, it's still being done this way. Thank you. Um, can we have a final virtual round of applause for all our speakers? And thank you for everybody for engaging and asking questions. I didn't want to cut off the conversation. Um, so moving along to the, the breakout discussions, we don't have much time left. So I'm gonna adapt what I suggested a little bit, which it was why I suggested it, made it as adaptable as possible. Um, so we have um, some discussion topics, but I think mainly what we would like to get from you today is, um, it'd be really great to get your insights on the types of things that we should be discussing and offering as discussion prompts at Collaborations Workshop. So I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms. Um, there are four. The first one is fair research software. The next one is diversity and inclusion. The third one is software sustainability. And then there's a lucky dip or other. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you have ideas of what you want to see discussed, or if you want to go through the list that is compiled in the notes and kind of um, uh, restructure them into what you think would make a good discussion group prompt at CW20, um, that would be really great. But we really mainly want to maybe make sure we want to capture the fellows sort of insights and, and what you're interested in, in discussing and in hearing discussed at one of these um, at this event. Um, but if you don't want to do any of that, then we have an, an additional breakout room that you can go into and just chat with folks. Um, does anybody have any questions on that? I know it's kind of a last minute thing. I'll close um, the group in about 10 minutes, but Go for it. <laughs> or you can hang out in here with me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I know that was a bit of a mad dash. Um, I just wanted to give the opportunity to, to get your thoughts down, um, even if it was just over a few minutes. So um, it looks like y'all got pretty far um, during that amount of time. So thank you so much for contributing um, to that. Um, yep, so CW is just around the corner. Um, 
2019 and 2020 fellows um, can all register for free. So if you need me to um, resend any instructions on that, let me know. And all continuing fellows as well, there's um, a pot of funding if you need support um, to attend CW21, we would love to have you. Um, but yeah, are there any kind of final announcements or shout outs that anybody wants to make? Thank you, Rachel, again. Maybe we shall give an applause to Rachel. <laughs> for, for organizing. Really rushed and um, random end to the community call. Um, it's really wonderful to see you all. Um, the next, oh, Shwed. So I was just going to say, if, if people have got any final thoughts, please feel free to add them to the doc. Maybe Rachel was going to say that. Yeah, feel free to add any. Um, there will also be other opportunities at um, CW20 one to um, add any final discussion topics. Um, but thank you so much. Um, the next community call will be after CW uh, because I can't focus on too many things at once. Um, but yeah, it was great to see you. Um, I'll send out a newsletter uh, next week, kind of recapping everything in with links. And um, great to see you all and hope to see you again soon.